Well, good morning. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, Tom. You gave it just the way my mother wrote it. Uh, I do appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm not going to try and follow Tom uh, with his uh, Shakespearean performance because the, the only line that, that I really can remember was from 106, part two, uh, where the conspirators say, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. And as a lawyer, I probably don't want to suggest that. Uh, but it is appropriate that we're here uh, in this theater, uh, the home of the Shakespeare Company here in Washington, because we do want to talk about a drama. The drama of what I believe is going to be an age of energy innovation. Uh, and I think that's why this event is so important. And it's the, one of the reasons why I'm here, because I think there are three things that are going on that suggest we're on the verge uh, of a complete revolution uh, in our industry. First, we're facing new kinds of challenges, and by that I mean increasingly complex and far-reaching issues, issues like climate change. If we're serious about solving these complex issues, there's no way around the fact that it's going to require innovation on a very massive scale that we haven't thought of before. Uh, the second reason is we've crossed into a new frontier in terms of technology. Things that we couldn't even fathom 10 years ago are now a reality, and they're within our reach. And it's fundamentally changing our expectations and about the behaviors of our customers out there. And finally, the third reason is that there's a new generation of innovators who are being inspired, inspired by all of this. Energy is capturing the interest and imagination of some of the brightest and boldest thinkers out there today. Everyone I meet wants to be in our industry. I see that in Silicon Valley down the road from our headquarters in San Francisco, where hardly a week goes by without a call from somebody who has some new energy-related app or some new energy-related device uh, that is going to change the industry. And I see it here at the Challenge Cup, uh, in the teams that are competing to see who can provide the next big thing to help us use energy more efficiently, uh, store energy longer, or something that we aren't even thinking about yet, uh, but will revolutionize the business. When we combine that inspiration with the power and potential of today's technology, and put it together with the changing demands of our consumers, you've got the stuff that revolutions are made of. We've already seen this kind of revolution in the telecom world, and the IT world, and I want you to think about the implications of this statement. By 2020, 80% of the world's adults will have a supercomputer in their pockets. Now, we usually don't think of smartphones uh, that way, but that's what they really are. And it's not just the fact that we all have supercomputers, it's the, that those supercomputers are super connected. Cisco estimates that things connected to the internet by 2020 will number 50, will number 50 pay by the year 2020. Think about how much these trends have changed our lives in the past decade. Ten years ago, there were no apps. You couldn't order an Uber. You couldn't use Periscope to show our event live uh, to friends today. You know, someone who served in nuclear submarines, Periscope meant having a view that was about this big. Uh, today, Periscope means having a worldwide view of everything that's going on. Uh, you also couldn't change the temperature in your home from here. <clears> or <throat> see how much electricity you just sold to the utility from your rooftop solar panel. Technology and innovation have changed how we use and interact with almost everything and everyone. As I mentioned, it's fundamentally changed the expectations of our customers. We live in an on-demand world where you can get just about anything you want, anytime you want, and how you want it. Fast, efficient, personalized, and convenient. And now we want virtually every facet of our lives to be just as smart, and integrated, and seamless as the web. Uh, so all of this, I think, is relevant as we think about how the energy business is evolving. For our customers, this is an era of choice and control over their energy unlike anything before. But do they really want to control energy? I don't think so. I think what they want is control over their lives so that they can meet their personal wants and needs whether it's their needs for their budget, or their schedule, or their environmental values, or whatever it is. And the new energy tools and technology will do just that. They will open up a whole new world in terms of our ability to make our energy future cleaner, 
more efficient, and more sustainable. These devices are also going to allow us to continue improving the resiliency and reliability of our energy supply. And they're going to help us make energy more affordable and make the economy even more competitive. But the reality is that the key to revolutionizing our economy isn't just creating one of these new technologies. The key lies in how we connect them together. These new technologies are far more powerful and far more valuable when they're interconnected. It's just like the value of a computer. It can do a lot by itself. But it's infinitely more powerful and more valuable when it's connected to the internet. And the way we're going to make that connectivity possible in the energy space is by re-envisioning and reinventing the grid of the 21st century. The vision that we're moving toward in our company is something that we call the grid of things. It's the same concept as the Internet of Things. We are like the Internet, we are like the Internet, the grid is going to become the platform for integrating and maximizing the value of all of these new energy technologies. That's why I believe that the grid is going to be just as valuable and just as indispensable in the next hundred years as it has been in the past hundred. And that's what's driving some of our investments and our thinking in PG&E. Besides being able to put a solar panel on the rooftop, our customers may want battery storage or a power wall. Uh, they want to use these technologies to work together with their smart thermostat and time of use rates. Or they may want to charge their electric vehicle anywhere, anytime, and sell stored electricity back to the grid uh, to deal with demand response issues. They also may want to plug in new devices and access new services from other provider, providers, possibly some of you in the room, and they'll expect seamless communication with their utility. If we're serious about fully realizing the potential of all of this innovation, about making renewables the go-to technology of the future, or achieving even bigger gains in energy productivity, then the grid of things is the model that we have got to move towards. With that vision, so let me talk about some of the steps that we need to take to get there. The first is investment. We've got to continue to invest in grid modernization, which means far more than just replacing wires and poles. It means putting in sophisticated IT and operating technology and data analytics that allow us to optimize that technology. Today, we only use a fraction of the system capacity so that we have a reserve margin. Well, if through system op op optimization, we can cut into just a fraction of that reserve that's now needed, uh, we can make tremendous gains in productivity. System investment means adding new voltage controls to allow the grid to handle power from multiple sources, and advanced sensors to give us the visibility in, into how we're going to run the system in the future. This is an important part of increasing renewable use to previously unthought of levels. It means providing new grid devices and grid services to our customers, like electric vehicle charging stations. It means greater automation. Over the past few years at pg e we've invested in smart switches that link to our smart meters that have helped avoid millions of minutes of interruptions for our customers and move us towards a goal of a self-healing grid. Estimates are that our country needs about a trillion dollars in electric infrastructure investment over the next 15 years to make this a reality. That's a huge challenge but an all, also a huge opportunity to fuel innovation and create jobs and position our economy for the future. Which leads me to our second point. It's crucial that we have far-sighted policies that are designed to foster innovation and investment. That includes everything from how we structure utility rates to how we think about tax policies that impact access to capital. You know, come to think of it, if Thomas Edison were here today, he probably would recognize today's electric rate structures out there. And that's something that's got to change. We also need policies that set standards for interoperability of smart uh, technologies and internet devices so that we can mix and match the best technologies to meet the changing needs of our customers. Cybersecurity is another critical area where we need policies that facilitate private public sector cooperation. The dark underside of this technology revolution is the introduction of millions of portals into our critical infrastructure, and we have to figure out ways to deal with that. It even extends to areas like workforce development, where it's important to leverage public-private partnerships 
in order to build a pipeline of workers with the right skills to support this revolution. But maybe most significant of all, we need to get the policies right to have a fighting chance to achieve our long-term environmental goals, particularly on greenhouse gases. And I want to take a minute to talk about carbon and greenhouse gas policy in particular because I think it's a fundamental issue in our energy future and we can do so much to move ourselves in the right direction uh, with technology developments. Many of you may know that uh, California has been moving forward aggressively on this channel. Just two weeks ago, Governor Brown issued an executive order uh, calling for 40% reduction in greenhouse gases from 1990 levels by 2030. Uh, and our company and others in California support that goal. But the key to achieving it is going to be allowing California to do what it seems to do best, and that is innovate. Greenhouse gas policy should encourage cross-sector reductions and establish a framework <coughs> that enables us to make the right choices for our customers and for the operation of our system. We think the best way to do that is putting a price on carbon, which is exactly what California has done through its cap and trade program. And we're working to have our state create a flexible model that other states uh, can follow. By giving flexibility to states or regions of this country to mix and match solutions for greenhouse gases, we can optimize the results. But to do that will require greater control of the grid and better, better understanding of what's going on with our energy usage. So the last point I want to underscore about the grid of things is the importance of collaboration. In the past, our industry came, uh, in, innovation in our industry came largely from within. In the future, a lot more is going to come from non-traditional players like all of you here in this theater. Utilities aren't going to create this future alone. Even if we wanted to, we probably can. Our role is going to be about providing the means to integrate all of this uh, innovation. And we believe the companies that are going to be successful at that are the ones that reach out and develop robust partnerships. That's one of our priorities at PG&E, and we've already seen what an impact it can make. Working with companies like Opower and Silver Spring Networks and Solar City and Picaro, each of these companies are now well established in the energy space. And they're ones that we started working with to help them get started. We shared knowledge, or provided access to capital, or lent expertise, or provided support in the regulatory or policy arena. And we're continuing to do this today with companies big and small. That's why EEI is sponsoring a, com a conference like this, because it's crucial uh, to our industry. I mean, for example, we're now partnering with BMW as we pi pilot vehicle-to-grid technology in Northern California. Another example of our collaboration is with a smaller transportation company called Via Motors, which is working to perfect, perfect an extended range electric work truck with exportable power capabilities, which is another potentially game-changing technology for our industry. And I'm convinced that this kind of collaboration is going to become an even bigger part of the roles utilities play. I want to wrap up just by underscoring what a pivotal moment this is for the future of our economy and the environment. Now, I know in a, a theater that's here to talk about the future, it's a little odd that I'm going to be talking about someone from the past, and that's George Schultz, who was Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, and Secretary of Labor, and he's certainly an icon still in Northern California. In 94, he's the quintessential American statesman, and he's still active in uh, energy policy issues through the Hoover Institute. Uh, and recently he made a comment uh, that I like to quote. Uh, and he said something about today uh, that is absolutely true. He said, we're on the cusp of a much better energy future that we have ever imagined. And we can get there by playing our cards right, and it really isn't all that difficult. And you know what? He's right. It's not that difficult. We are holding the cards to be successful. If we continue to make the right investments, to set the right policies, and most importantly, to work together collaboratively, I believe that we can get there to that future. The partnership between big and small, established and startup, traditional and unconventional organizations, all will contribute something to this new energy future, and we all have an important role to play. So we look forward to what that energy future holds for our company, our industry and our customers and our country. And I personally look forward to working with many of you to make sure that we do that. So
So thank you very much and have a great day.